Hey guys, welcome back to today's channel. So in this video, we're going to be talking about um, gene technology. And this is part one of two. So in this video, we're going to be talking about um, four different aspects of gene tech. First of all, it's going to be practicals. Um, the experiments involved with gene tech or using mechanisms from gene tech. We've got enzymes and other important molecules. And we've also got the steps, which I'll be going into detail later on. So, first of all, um, let's go through the enzymes. We've, we've got restriction endonucleases, DNA polymerase, DNA ligase, TAC DNA polymerase, which is a type of DNA polymerase that is thermoresistant and this is used for in um, PCR polymerase chain reaction which I'll be covering later on in the video <clears throat> so the function of restriction endonuclease is, is that for if you have a double strand DNA um, it will essentially cut at um, across unevenly across the phosphate backbone for example it cuts here and it cuts here and in the end you would produce two different <laughs> fragments and you get um, a fragment looking like this the top part is longer so it's like that and then the, this one the bottom part is longer so it Yep, just like that. Like, but so you create these sticky ends. These are called sticky ends. And they can be joined with other sticky ends that has kind of complementary base pairings with these two ends. So this is a type of restriction enzyme or endonucleases that give you sticky ends. There's also ones that give you blunt ends where instead of cutting the phosphate backbone unevenly, they'll just cut straight across like that which will give you straight blunt ends with no bases sticking out and then you can add more um you can add more nucleotides at the end by using dna ligase and splicing it All right which okay which brings me on to dna ligase the function of it is to for example after you've cut the blunt ends right as i said earlier you can add DNA fragments together, then it will it will synthesize or catalyze the um, synthesization of the phosphodiester bond between these two nucleotides. Right, so they'll add, the, they'll help join them together. DNA polymerase, which is quite easy, they bind onto a piece of single strand DNA, right, and they will they will form, they will move forward like this and they'll synthesize the other complementary base right uh, DNA polymerase is used in DNA synthesization to form the double strand one and now we've got so tac polymerase DNA and DNA polymerase is the same now we've got reverse transcriptase which is you, for example, if you have a piece of mRNA, it can reverse synthesize a single-stranded single complementary DNA from this one, and then you'd get the, the original DNA, except for the fact that the, the piece, the single-stranded complementary piece of DNA that the um, reverse transcriptase made would only be the exons part of the original DNA because the mRNA has already been um, gone through splicing and yeah so it has cut off the introns parts and now it only has the exons part yeah so those are the overall structures of the four enzymes involved these two are the same essentially now we're going to be moving into other important molecules so we've got primers and promoters so there are different and promoters are basically so if you haven't learned about lac operon promoters are regions 
for example, this is, this is like a long single strand piece of DNA, right? And then this is your promoter. This guy, it helps RNA, RNA polymerase to bind and onto it and goes along to synthesize um, for, for translation. So this is your original gene, right? You've got some um, LAC A Z Y. For example, this is it. Uh, for example, of um, the LAC operon, the RNA polymerase will bind onto the promoter region, and it will slide along. It it will help RNA polymerase to get a grip on the the um, gene and start translating to form our mRNA. On the other hand, um, for primers, primers are not part of the gene itself. But rather, sorry, so there is a short strand of RNA or DNA that helps binding. They have complementary base pairings at the start of the sequence and they help the DNA polymerase, a DNA polymerase that binds this primer and starts synthesizing. And they and this used for DNA replication. So primers are involved with translation, and it helps RNA polymerase. Promoters are involved with DNA replication, and it helps DNA polymerase. So that's the main difference between the two. Then you've got uh, vectors. A vector is, uh, in this case specifically in gene tech, is plasmid. And vectors definition are they help introduce genes or genetic materials into the the host cell or organism to start producing the protein or whatever the thing was coding for, right? So vectors in this case will be plasmid circular DNA that replicates in the bacteria independent from its other um, genetic material. And then you can like use restriction enzymes to cut this open form, you know, from this incomplete horseshoe shape. And then you can add other um, pieces of gene uh, genes in. And then if you reintroduce it into your um, bacterial cell, it can then reproduce. It can, you know, and then translate. Um, trans oh, sorry. Yeah. So just to fix up, primers are involved with transcription, not translation. Transcription is the first stage of mRNA production, not translation of not, not making the protein from the mRNA, but rather transcription. And then, then from this, from then on, the uh, thing can breed off, right? So forth. That's essentially the basic overview of the steps. But then again, I'll over, um, cover that later on. For market gene, if you're putting things in a an organism right, and bacterial cell, you want to know if the bacteria has truly successfully transformed or taken up your genetic material that you've introduced into it and producing stuff. So you've got to add like a sort of like a marker gene that fluorescence under UV lights or on, on other you know, visible lights which that can be helped to identify if the genes has been successfully uptaken or not. And then you've got gene, bro gene pro, which is a short single stranded piece of DNA that is that has bases that are complementary to the genes or whatever they're trying to test for it. For example, if I'm introducing a specific gene, the gene probe can be used as a market gene, a sort of market gene. It can be colorful. This, this one's colorful. Or this one is, this one's also colorful, but it works in a different way, essentially. So market gene is when you shine UV light through it, it fluorescence. This one, just the present presence of the gene probe will fluoresce. It will, it will give off a color and then you can know if it's present or not. So it has bases complementary to the genes that you're testing for. And once you, when you 
once you add the gene probe into the single stranded piece of DNA of gene, right? And then you wait for a while to let hybridization to occur. And then you can wash it off. And then if you've got colors, you can, you know, you, you know that it's present and how much is present, which is essentially what microarray is. Right. Now let's go through the steps for gene, uh, step gene tech overall, right? Let's go do that right now. <clears throat> so overall, first step will be, so you know, um, what the purpose of gene technology is you introduce genetic genes from an organism into another organism for it to produce the proteins of that gene for you. And then, for example, a case example is insulin, right? Or golden rice, um, which is part of the syllabus as well. Insulin, we used to have to crush pigs' livers for insulin, but now you can genetically modify bacterial cells to, you know, to, to make them pr produce insulin for you. And then you can harvest, mass harvest them, and it's a much more efficient quick and less expensive process than just killing pigs for its liver right so those are what the the um, purposes of gene techs are for and now we're going to be moving into the step so first step will be isolation of either the gene so a section of the dna or you can also isolate or the mRNA, right? That's how you do it. If it's for the gene isolation, you can skip step two. Step two would just be um, you use reverse transcriptase to synthesize the single-stranded complementary piece of DNA from the mRNA, right? And then you can also skip step three, which is DNA polymerase, just completing the double-stranded piece of DNA that, so from, from the single-stranded piece that the reverse transcriptase has produced, DNA polymerase will add on to it, plus primers. So as I said earlier in the video, primers help the DNA polymerase out. And then now you go to step four. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is after you've isolated the gene, you now have to cut the plasmid or the vector. So cut plasmid using restriction enzymes or endonucleases, same thing. And this works for both mRNA and for sections of DNA. So you cut the piece of plasmid, the restriction enzyme, and cut the DNA or gene slash mRNA with the same one. Important that it's the same, same one. So they'll cut across the same DNA sequence that it's coded to cut for to form um, sticky ends. You provide, you form sticky ends, right? So cut, they're both the same thing. And then now you just have to introduce the promoter. You know, you can add them to each other and then test them out. So step number five is to introduce the promoter. plus the gene into the plasmid along with your plus mark gene so these three go together and step six is oh actually 
So we'll swap this around. We have the do this first. This is step this is step six five in reality. You have to use PCR first because you want to amplify amplify the number of genes you have to be able to then you know add multiple copies of that particular gene into many different plasmids, into many different bacteria to produce it for you. So you swap these two around basically. So that's step six. Step seven is to just multiply them, right? Like like I said, you add to to a mm, factory and then you grow them up, grow them out, right? So you just keep growing them out. And so after you've introduced into this one, you have to use DNA ligase as well. DNA ligase to basically like, you know, like you've got the section of the, it's just been added. You have to complete the entire plasmid into one recombinant plasmid, right? So you have to use DNA ligase to form the phosphodiester the bonds between them. The number eight, this is quite like specific. This is like a specific way of testing how it works. And you can do this by grow into a Petri dish. So you can take from this factory a small colony of bacteria and grow it into a Petri dish. You don't actually have to have this stage at this point. So grow them in a Petri dish. And then step nine is to add or press nitro cellulose filter paper onto the colony and then you would produce a mirror image of what the com colony looks like and now you can lice so 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 when you do press it onto the um to the petri dish there'll be some bacteria from each you know, from the entire colony that will stick onto the paper and then you can now add alkali plus heat to basically kill off the bacteria, break down the cell wall and then denature the double-stranded DNA into single-stranded so that alkali will do that, heat will do the rest because DNA, remember, is a acid deoxyribose nucleic acid and you'd add, add alkali to like break the hydrogen bonds between them and also heat to form single stranded then now you can add your gene probe right step 11 is add gene probe and then wait for a while for them to hybridization to hybridize hybridize is when you just form or complete the hydrogen bonds between the two single strands of DNA and then just the rest will wash off and then just check for the color of which one's present if there's there's color present on whatever bacteria there are on the piece of paper you know which colony has successfully uptaken or has successfully transformed into a transgenic bacteria bacterium and you can just collect those bacteria from the colony that has the um, the uh, the color or the color present then just grow them in a factory now this is when the factory step is and then you can use this dna ligase as your step seven right so this is like the overall steps of gene technology and you don't really need from step eight to step 12 it's just like a way of testing it in reality you can the marker gene here is already sufficient enough to tell if the um, bacteria or the organism has successfully uptaken your genes right and um yeah we'll now move on to the practical sets involved into gene technology and we'll go through pcr first so pcr is polymerase chain reaction it's when you want to amplify gene folks its application includes you know in the um uh for example crime scene investigation you've got a sample of blood you can take the sample and amplify the genes present 
and then you can apply use different copies of the genes and apply them into different tests in order to figure out who the culprit is and it's really useful in other areas of bio as well and so the first step is to the nature so you've got your dna sample it is to denature the um the gene right to form to form single stranded and you can do this by raising the temperature to around 90, 70 to 90 degrees <coughs> around 90 degrees second step okay so you can actually use this you for this one you use a thermocycler when you put like it's like a, a machine and you can like put like a bunch of test tubes in it so it's got holes you can put a bunch of test tubes into the slots and it can vary the temperature it can heat them up it can cool them down quickly step two is annealing so you add the um the ntps dinucleotide triphosphates deoxynucleotide triphosphates into your your gene sample for pcr <clears throat> Actually, oh, actually, I should have included DNTPs in my other important molecules. But basically, you add you know, annealing, uh, DNTPs to them. And then you also add sorry, sorry, primers to the gene, right, to, for, for DNA polymerase to work. And this is when you lower temperature down into around 50 degrees. Um, you basically allow the hydrogen bonds to form, reform again, and that's when you can like add DNTPs primers into it, and then they reform hydrogen bonds, and that's called annealing. And the third step is to increase the temperature again. It's around seventy degree, and it's. You know, like you, it's called tech polymerase because th these are DNA polymerase from a species called Thermus aquitus. Right, <clears throat> and now it's around seventy degree. This is its ideal temperature, and you can then you now synthesize it. Accordingly, so this is the step is called synthesization. Okay, so that's the third step of PCR, or this is called extension, whatever you want to call it. And that's basically the three main steps of PCR. Now we've got gel electrophoresis. And let's say you've got this. Well, over here, this is how the thing would actually look. Um, it's like a basic structure. So this is the well. This is the anode. Oh, so it's just the cathode, my bad. And this one is the anode. Well, this is your gel, agarose gel. So this is in form of colloid. It's a solid, but with big gaps between the atoms to allow substances to move through. So well, you've got buffer solution. So this is the basic setup of gel electrophoresis too. You can add your DNA samples into here and then it will go, it will move through the um, gel colloid because of the, uh, the 
potential difference set across the two electrodes or ends. DNA is naturally negative because of the phosphate group and the backbone. So they'll move away from the negative to the positive end. And buffer solution is like electrolyte. It allows for the DNA with ions in it for the DNA to move across. And then, yes, yeah, so the further the DNA moves, so basically DNA have piece fragments have the same charge, right? Because of the negative. And then you, you're just basically measuring the mass and length of the DNA fragments when you add to this well. And so if you want to do a DNA, like for example, you form that, you form this dotted line, like all lines across um, test basically you can analyze them and to do so is you have to break uh, the dna down into fragments and you use restriction enzymes to cut the dna into unique fragments and then you add those unique fragments into the well and start um, electrophoresis and they have different as you know different organisms have different DNA composition. So the sections of DNA that has that specific base sequences that the reverse, uh, sorry, the, the restriction enzymes cut across will be different in different parts and have different amounts. So basically you provide or you, you get a unique DNA fragment collections and you can then analyze it, add it to phoresis, and then you produce a very unique graph so for microarray you basically perform the same steps it's you, you use the same mechanism short sorry but it's for when you want so the purpose is number one is which gene is present number two is gene expression and this can be broken down into what and rate so gene presence you can use this to between two cells of different organisms or well, this one you can use it for two cells of the same organisms but different types same organism yeah singular so you measure what gene is being expressed because you know that autosomal cells of an organism have the same amount of genes it's just that different genes are being expressed a specific time you don't know what genes are expressed and the rate or how much um, of that gene is being expressed this is essentially the two main questions you've got to answer for microarray so microarray is essentially like is grid over here you got the big grid um there'll be like a lot of grids and in each grid you've got gene probes like multiple gene probes attached to it for example you know of the same gene probe multiple attached to to one specific and each of these grid so these guys right here right for example this one sorry this one would have this right it's so a gene probe which is attached to this grid these guys have are the same gene probe these guys are different so each grid will have a collection of different gene probes that are unique. And then essentially the mechanism is when you add your DNA sample into it, the single-stranded one, whatever gene is present will be complementary to either one of these many different grids and a color will be shown on there. So that's like the basic mechanism. To get that first, you basically have to... First step is you <coughs> collect... So, so for the gene presence for the same organism, but different cells, you collect the DNA fragments of the, the two cells, right? And then you can test them out by lysing them, breaking them into um, single stranded. And then you es essentially add like a marker gene into it. You can color code them green and red, right? Normally they use green and red. You mix the green and red mixture together 
to form a yellow color. And then you just pour on every single one of these grids at the same amount, right? And then you would wait for some time for it to react to form colors. And then whatever grid you see have a color on them will show you that, well, this gene, specific gene is being expressed because these gene probes, it's already been attached to this one. You know what they are complementary. They know what gene or what proteins, what functions they're complementary to. So you know exactly what genes are present. But however, it's a little different for when you are expressing, you want to find what genes are being expressed or what the rate of them, right? So you, you do the same thing. But the, in this time, you ha you don't take the DNA of the genes from a different um, organisms because you know that for a fact that they have different gene presence. And you always, what you want to do is what genes is being expressed and what gene is, what's the rate of that? Of course, you can use this, this specific step for cells of the same organisms as well, but this is for different purposes, basically. And so if you want to uh, identify or if you want to investigate the different rate and what genes are being expressed, you have to take the mRNA first. You can't just measure how much protein is being produced because it will be very hard. So you just take the mRNA, you reverse transcriptase it, you amplify them through PCR, which, I, which we covered earlier in the video use restriction enzymes to cut the double strand down and then you would denature it again to form single stranded then you just color code them and add them to each grid so that's essentially how it works and yeah that is about it thank you for watching the video we'll see you in part two